So welcome all to this event organized by the Left Forum. Left Forum is a left-wing think tank here in Finland and this, this event is supported by Rosa Luxemburg uh, London office. So welcome to you all here at the Rosebud Sivunen bookshop and everyone else in the, in the stream. My name is Antti Saarla and I'm, and I'm a member of the executive board of Left, Ally, Left, U, uh, Left Forum, all of these left organizations. So welcome all. We, ha we have now a discussion about the situation of trans rights, especially in Europe. We are going to talk about the situation also here in Finland, but in next week, Vasem Mr. Linki, which is a party chapter here in Helsinki, will have a especially uh, event especially focusing on that. So we are going to be speaking more, more broadly about the situation in Europe. And I hope that we all have fun here, we learn more we have, and we respect each other and we don't assume anything about the people here, their gender or their class background or anything like that. So let's respect and respect each other. So we have a really, really nice discussion and we have a lot of time for questions from the audience. And so I would like to ask you to have a like, a, like talk about yourselves a little bit, and I would start by Pinja. Could you introduce yourselves? Hi, so I'm Pinja Vuorinen. I'm the chair of Left Youth of Finland, uh, which does the youth work for the Left Alliance Party. I use pronouns they, them. Uh, I actually did my undergraduate uh, in Glasgow uh, in economics and politics, and now besides being the chair of the Left Youth, I study global political economy in the Helsinki University. Hi everyone, I'm Nadia Whittam. I'm the Labour Member of Parliament for Nottingham East, which is a city right in the middle of England. It's where Robin Hood came from. Um, I'm also the youngest Member of Parliament in the UK and have been, I'm part of the queer community. Um, I use she, her pronouns and um, have, we've been doing lots of work in the UK on trans rights. Thank you, nice to have you here. And I'm Kasper Kivista. I'm the chairperson of Trasek, which is an organization for trans and intersex rights. I use the pronouns he and they. Really nice to have you here. So let's start with the situation here in Finland. So we have a new trans law now now accepted into parliament and it has its own flaws. But could you, Pinja, tell us more about the new law here in Finland? Yes, so the law passed a few weeks ago uh, in the parliament, the Trans Act, and I would say the central part of it, it makes possible for you to judicially uh, change your gender or to like correct your gender uh, without the need of sterilization, which has been uh, the situation previously, so a very inhumane law as it was. So now there is like a 30 day period of re reflection, but you can do it like brilliantly. And I don't know if you, for example, want to still tell us about, because uh, despite it being a great improvement on the previous situation, there is still some parts missing as well. So the legal gender recognition uh, can be done, uh, like you said, uh, with your own testimony, but you still have to wait 30 days uh, for them to start considering it. So we. The problem at the moment with that is that you don't know when your legal gender marker will change. And this is something that we're still working on, that this cannot be the case that someone might be traveling abroad and then suddenly their gender marker changes and their social security number changes, meaning their passport is invalid after that. So we're, we're trying to work with the officials to make sure that the timeline is reasonable. But other than that, uh, unfortunately, uh, the, the underage trans people were left outside of the law. So even though the suggestion said clearly that it seems to be against the best interest of the youth and internationally acknowledged that youth should be included, but still they decided to vote against it and decided that it's possible legal gender recognition is only possible after 18. Other than that, we did, we were hoping for a couple of other laws. They're not exactly in the same law, but we were hoping that they would have been dealt with simultaneously, which were um, 
the protection of intersex people, especially intersex children, their bodily um, uh, autonomy, so that uh, no cosmetic surgery would be uh, would be forced upon them before they are uh, old enough to make decisions about their body. And the other one was um, the third legal gender, which I have to say is something that's very uh, universally understood, but still Finland has not decided to use that. Yeah, yeah and after you very clearly uh, showing what is included, but also unfortunately not included in the law. I would also like to add about the process a bit, because it was in the government program uh, since uh, the beginning, so almost four years, yet it took until this time to even for the law to pass, and there was actually a lot of worry whether it would be passed at all, whether it be put to the parliament, and until the very last minute uh, there were even in the parliament, voices trying to block this, not just the opposition, but within the government as well, and especially in the center party. So it's also not something that, or it is something that was fought hard for, and it's not just like because of the people in the parliament or the good people in the parties, it's because of civic society fighting for this for almost a decade or over uh, for this to be passed. Exactly. I was going to say that it, it, uh, we have been concentrating on what happened now, this year, but we did have almost, we went through with the legal gender recognition law in uh, 2014. Uh, they, they were writing the law already. It was good to go, but then they were able to block it uh, in the government. So we were very worried that that same thing would happen now. So as someone who's been working with this issue for like seven, more than seven years, um, until that last moment when they said it's actually now voted for it, it's, it's done, I was still suspecting that they would take it away from us, so that something would go wrong. But we're now really happy because even though I did focus a little bit on the negative, what's missing, but I do want to point out that this is a huge step forward, huge step forward, and we really appreciate this law, even with its flaws. Yeah, thank you. So let's now go to United Kingdom and the situation in Scotland. We we read, read from a news that there's a, that there's not a fric fraction now uh, with, within the UK especially considering the trans law, trans act now in the Scotland. Could you tell us more about the current situation? Yeah, okay, this might be quite a long one. So, um, firstly, I, I just want to pay tribute particularly to Finnish trans activists who have managed to get this law through because you're completely right when you say that none of the wins, that none of the rights that we have were gifted to us by parliament and by benevolent politicians. They were fought for by activists, often at, at great cost. So, like, huge well done to all of you for pushing this up the political agenda and, and making it happen and not taking no for an answer. Um, I think Finland's decision to finally um, reform the gender recognition process and to demedicalize it is is huge and gives people in, in the UK a, a great deal of hope, particularly as you're joining many other countries that have already done the same thing, like Denmark, Ireland, Portugal, Argentina. Um, the situation in the UK is things are, are going in the opposite direction. Things are getting much worse for trans people and for the LGBTQ community more widely. So just to, to demonstrate that, back in 2015, the UK was ranked number one um, for in, in the um, International LGBTI Association of Europe index that they publish annually. Um, we're now 14 out of 49 countries and we're falling every year. Then last year, the Council of Europe named the UK alongside Russia, Hungary and Poland as um, one of the countries where LGBTQ rights are under threat and that's because of what's what's happening around trans rights and the way that certain politicians, um, the government, media figures and, and newspapers are, are whipping up this hatred against trans people. So 
back in 2017, Theresa May, who was the Prime Minister like four Prime Ministers ago, even though it's not actually that long ago, <laughs> and she was, she was considered to be quite right-wing, even within the Conservative Party, but she pledged back in 2017 that there would be reform of the Gender Recognition Act, and it was not that controversial. Um, it was something that even, even she was pledging because it seemed so common sense. Um, it had like quite a lot of cross-party support. Um, it basically meant, so currently in, in the UK, the Gender Recognition Act says that you have to be diagnosed with a medical disorder, with gender dysphoria, which obviously that is no longer recognised by the World Health Organisation. Being trans is, is not an illness. Um, so we're, we're out of step with the WHO. And you also have to, to demonstrate that you've been living in your gender identity for at least two years, which is a really, it's, it's a timely, it's a, a dehumanising process. It means that you're sort of having your gender policed, often by cisgender people, and having to just undergo really humiliating interviews and, and tests and things. And as a result, only an estimated 1% of trans people in the UK have a gender recognition certificate. So this reform was meant to be streamlining the process, demedicalizing it, and saying that you can obtain a gender recognition certificate by self-declaration, so similar to, to what Finland has now. As I said, it had a lot of cross-party support, um, had massive public support, and that was shown in the, in the government consultation. But then a small minority of anti-trans people became very vocal and whipped up what has now become this, this moral panic. And now we're three prime ministers later, we don't have reform, um, and actually those plans have been shelved indefinitely. So um, coming on to Scotland, recently you might have seen it in the news a, a few weeks ago, um, Scotland had passed something similar to what Finland has just done in their devolved, devolved parliament. And not only is the Conservative government not doing what they'd pledged to do six years ago now, but they're so opposed to it that they've blocked the Scottish parliament from, from doing that. And they've used this power called Section 35, which is basically a, a power that the Westminster government has to veto decisions made in devolved parliaments. It's never been used before. Like, if, if we think about everything that's happened, like the independence debate with Scotland, Section 35 has never been used before, but the government is using it now to strip trans people of their rights. Um, and that's not only damaging trans rights, which is the most important thing here, but it's also... Um, delegitimizes the Scottish Parliament and rides roughshod over the devolution settlement that we have. So it, it's created this culture war and this political crisis. And over what? Because what we're speaking about is something, it's something so basic. Like I, I, I almost can't believe that we're speaking about Gender Recognition Act reform when that is, it's just giving trans people such a tiny shred of dignity doesn't even touch on all of the, the issues that are most important in trans people's lives and that are, are kind of issues of matter of life and death. These are, it, it's such a narrow application. It basically means people can be married in the correct gender, people can be buried in the correct gender, and people can receive their pension credit in the correct gender. That's it. It's got nothing to do with accessing toilets, accessing changing rooms, accessing um, domestic violence services, because it, it, it doesn't even have anything to do with getting a passport in, in your correct gender, because that's a, a different process. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of an overview of, of what's happening in the UK. Yeah, thank you. Go on. Yeah, I could also just add thank you for the very enlightening uh, saying of how the process goes. Like, I already remember when I studied back in Glasgow and they were, like, collecting comments regarding the Gender Recognition Act. And even then, like, you know, there was a lot of campaigning in the university by, like, queer groups and so on. And even then, like, it's such a long process that people have been fighting for. And then you see that, like, 
you could almost get it and then it gets blocked even by like the UK Parliament and I just think that's really tragic and at the same time that I have been very happy about the Trans Act uh, passing in Finland, I, my thoughts have also very much been in Scotland and with my friends in there who now cannot have the same thing because of that. Yeah, I would like to ask more, like a more common question about the culture because uh, I really like to read the Guardian newspaper and on this issue they are really like not so progressive and I was thinking about the, the more, more like prouder cultural the cultural atmosphere in UK. Do you see, do you think that it's getting more conservative on this issue and around other human rights issues also? I think probably the first thing to say is we've got this really bizarre coalition between die-hard conservatives, so like the US, because the opposition um, to trans rights in the US is coming from like die-hard Republicans. Um, so we've got the coalition of those people and a lot of the groups that are campaigning against this in the UK are funded by groups in the US that, that hold those views. But then also people who would describe themselves as feminists and would usually like consider themselves to be progressive. Um, I think it's important to say that they're in the minority of feminists. Women are overwhelmingly more supportive of trans rights than men are. We're, we're also seeing um, the LGBT community, people trying to divide us with groups like LGB Alliance, um, saying that essentially recognizing trans people is um, erasure of lesbians, um, which is obviously not the case. Um, but even then, lesbians are more supportive of trans rights than any other demographic. So I, I think I think people aren't sort of born transphobic, like they're not born racist and homophobic. And we've seen attitudes change as a result of a very concerted effort by politicians by sections of the media um, and by a kind of global campaign against trans rights which spans from Donald Trump in the US to Vladimir Putin in Russia and after a while sometimes that will rub off on people and you'll find people who uh, I don't think that they're they're bad people but they read every day in the newspapers that trans women and trans people in general are a threat to our children, are like some kind of like predators. And then they start to think, oh, maybe there is a problem. Um, and that's why it's, it's so important that all of us, but in particular cisgender allies, and I include myself in that, take very seriously the responsibility to, to push back against this and not just leave it to trans comrades to, to do that by themselves. Yeah. Uh, and I think you said a really important thing there when you said that it's a minority, but it's a loud minority. And I feel like the media has a big role to play in, he, uh, in this uh, matter all in all, because uh, it's kind of a made up polarizing question that that uh, people want to have more clicks people want more viewers so when the majority is for the rights for the human rights so wh the only people who are against it are very hardcore um, conservatives not just in the uh, rainbow rights issue, but also abortion rights, women's rights, all in all, uh, very fundamentalist uh, religion background and so on. So they get the same platform to talk about these issues as professionals get. They only have their opinion that's based on their background and their beliefs, uh, not, not just religious, but their personal beliefs. Uh, and they get the same weight, their words get the same weight in, uh, in the media as the people who have actually studied these things, doctors, psychiatrists, people who have actually gone through this, have lived this life. So I feel like this is very disrespectful from media to put m my experience against someone who has never ever 
kind of even met a trans person before me, for example. So that we are put together, so it looks like to the viewer that w these opinions, th these are opinions, these are different but equal opinions when the other one is a studied fact and the other one is a, an opinion. Exactly, and I think it um, kind of creates a false equivalence and a false parity between someone's real life and all, all of the all, all of the problems that 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 brings, and all of the heightened problems that it, it brings, like increased rates of domestic and sexual violence, increased rates of homelessness, um, poorer conditions at work, poorer pay, and then just bigotry and it's kind of saying um, on the one hand this person thinks that trans people should be stripped of all rights and dignity and humanity and then on the other hand they shouldn't as though they're kind of equal opinions. I think what you said about abortion rights and reproductive rights is also really important because we can see that it's not always um, as I say they're uh, a minority a very small number of feminists who are anti-trans, who would invariably, I imagine, be good on reproductive rights, but kind of the root of transphobia and where most people come from is the kind of die-hard conservatives. And they're also opposing bodily autonomy for abortion rights. Um, and we kind of see that the, the converse is true. So in Spain, where they've just... Um, legislated, they've gone further than Finland actually and there are protections for intersex children um, but they've also at the same time legislated on abortion rights, I can't remember exactly what it was but I think um, for like 16 year olds so that's a really positive thing yeah. Pina, go on yeah, coming back to the debate thing also, I think it's just like simply horrifying that we can be like, oh, somebody's human rights what about these two sides? Let's debate. Because, of course, that is incredibly dehumanizing as well. And I think there is very much regarding the media and there is this culture war that they are gaining for, as you mentioned, through clicks and so on. And I would say that is also a larger picture, at least in Finland, also why uh, kind of the trans topics are coming to the surface is that, like, of course, it's been already almost, well, not quite a decade, but quite a few years since we passed the Equal Mari Marriage Act, but I would say after that, the focus has shifted in the conservative groups as well, very much to like trans people, because it's kind of like, well, we cannot stop like gay marriage anymore, but we can harm this marginalized, very vulnerable group. And I think that it's just horrific to see, but it's kind of playing out that these culture wars, or however you want to call them, uh, play out but actually just affect people's lives uh, so throughoutly. Yeah, even the party secretary of Christian Democrats, the Conservative Party in Finland, said that we lost the battle on equal marriage, so they don't want to discuss about that anymore, so they are shifting focus, as Pinya said. So you already uh, talked about Spain. How do you see the, like, the situation going forward in Europe as a whole? Are we moving forward or backwards? Do you see any, any pattern here? Anybody of you, you can start. I feel that it is polarizing that there are countries that are moving forward with great legislation, with huge jumps, and then there are sections who are definitely going backwards. Um, but again, we only kind of see the highlights of the news. For example, how many of you have heard about these uh, Polish cities declaring free of the rainbow agenda? But how many, have you, uh, how many of you have heard about uh, the activists in Poland being able to fight against it and getting some of these cities to go back on their word and kind of uh, take back what they said about uh, the rainbow rights and being more open again. So, so we are getting a lot of really horrible news, but I, I, as an activist, I really wish people would see more of the the positive, also the the fight against it, the the 
smaller victories that we're getting and the pushback that we are able to do as a, a as a kind of a movement of our own so that we are not crushed under the weight of depression go on yeah well i would say like you mentioned like polarization so at the same time we see that quite generally uh, the consensus or the social consensus is moving towards more positively towards more progress and these like respectable or like values that respect the existence of all people and you can see it like in the laws that pass and in like judicially it's a it's a slow process it's a way too slow process but it's happening but because it's happening you also get the conservative forces that then fight against even harder and harder so you get the very strong polarization. So I would say it's like, it's kind of doing both. That on one level, we are gaining ground and progress. But on the other hand, then it becomes uh, this narrative where the both sides seem equal and equally strong in that sense. Thank you. Do you want to comment? I, I completely agree with what's been said. I think that... Um, it is obviously becoming more polarized and that is a barrier to progress because it means that instead of instead of there being kind of a base level that is just accepted we're fighting for the the bare minimum in things like administrative reforms rather than looking at issues of trans healthcare gender affirming healthcare homelessness um discrimination at work sexual violence and domestic violence. Um, but I, I think, even though I've painted a really bleak picture of the situation in the UK, there are many, many people who support trans rights and who will stand with our trans siblings until we win this fight. Because I think, just like battles have been won before, just like you have won the battle in Finland, and obviously it's still ongoing, um, just as um, people who a kind of a couple of generations before me won the fight to abolish Section 28, which was the law in the UK, which meant that um, basically sexuality couldn't be discussed. Well, homosexuality couldn't be discussed. We will win this as well. I just hope that it's, it's very soon because in the meantime, people's real lives are being impacted by it and the consequences can even be deadly, whether that's waiting years for an appointment at a gender identity clinic, or whether it's the rise of hate crime. And adding to that, uh, you mentioned earlier the, uh, the World Health Organization, uh, that they have, uh, they have progress. They have declared that transgender is not uh, a, a psychiatric Disorder. It, it is its own uh, own box to tick. But but what I mean that uh, the scientists, the healthcare, the 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 science is going forward, and we hear about this all the time. And the international human rights uh, organizations, but also the um, court, international human rights courts, are making decisions for the rights of uh, trans people. So it's basically just the politicians who are trying to stop this uh, progress. And like you both mentioned about the Equal Marriage Act, um, I remember it very clearly. I was standing in front of the Parliament House when it, uh, <laughs> when it was passed, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so I remember the amount of hate speech and the same discussions. Uh, how about the children, predators, all these things. And we're not talking about that anymore. So I'm very hopeful that in a few years, this is going to blow over. We're going to, uh, unfortunately, something else will take our place. Someone else, some other minority will be attacked after us. That's how it always goes. And very lastly, I would like to add, as you said, we we are winning, we will win, and that is why they are fighting so hard. And it's like it's very tragic because it also does lead to so much hate speech, to even hate crimes, which none of these should exist. But yes, we are winning, so at least there's that to look forward to. Yeah. Uh, how, what can we do to raise 
solidarity to, to our comrades in other European countries? Do you see, like, like how can we help people in other countries? What kind of help would you <laughs> like us to give you? <laughs> Let's start with that. So we've, we've been meeting with, um, I'm here with two colleagues um, who are also both passionate about this issue. And we've been meeting with Finnish politicians and activists over the past couple of days in Helsinki. And I've been trying to understand how you got to this place in Finland and how we can repl replicate that by like, what, what arguments did you have internally and externally to, to convince people? And it does largely seem like things are just so much worse in the UK that I'm not, it's not immediately obvious to me what learning we can take from it other than like the strength of your movement and the fact that it won in the end. Um, I think there's also a lesson in like this is great that there's a progressive government, that there's a left alliance, um, a sort of red-green alliance in government. But even with that, there have been delays. And I think that shows us that we can't just... I, I mean, in, in the UK, we've had the, the Conservative Party in power for 13 years. People are getting really desperate. People are desperate for a Labour government. But we've also got to fight once we win a Labour government. It's not the case that... You win the election and then that's it. We sit back and relax. Everything else will be done for us. The struggle continues then. Yeah, if I can ask, like, how do you see the situation of Labour Party on this issue? So the Labour Party is um, has pledged to reform the Gender Recognition Act and to demedicalize it, which is a good thing. Um, but we need to be going much, much further than that, because actually the, the material issues that impact trans people every day aren't so much about a gender recognition certificate, though that is a, a small and important thing. It's about the fact that people are waiting several years to access gender-affirming healthcare. Those delays are having a really detrimental impact on people's mental health. Sometimes they can even be deadly. Um, Discrimination at work, so while we do have anti-discrimination laws, one in three employers openly say that they wouldn't hire a trans person. That's That just shows how much further we have to go. Then hate crimes are increasing. Um, recently, there was, and we, we don't know the reason um, for, for this murder, and we won't until there's been a full investigation, so I wouldn't comment on that. But recently, a 16-year-old trans girl in England was murdered. And um, that happened this week. And while we don't know the reasons for that, it's undeniable that that happened in the context of rising transphobia. So I'm, I'm glad that we have the commitment that we, that we have, but it, it needs to go much further than that. And actually, when we have trans liberation, that will kind of necessitate liberation for everybody. Like when we have queer liberation, that will mean liberation for straight people as well. When we have black liberation, that will also be liberation for white people because it frees all of us of, of those oppressive structures. Thank you, Kasper. Um, I'm, I want to comment on kind of what we did in Finland, like how we reached this point. Um, I, I'm going to say some of it was just lucky that we we could not have uh, planned this strategy because, of course, we didn't know which parties would be in the co uh, coalition and so on. Um, but I, I think with the previous coalition, we saw that there's no chance, absolutely no chance of getting our legislation uh, renewed. So we focused on peer education, what I would call it, that we were connecting with um, especially women's organizations and children's, uh, like organizations for, uh, um, well, children's, um, like 
protection of children. And these organizations, we had long conversations. What does it, what, what do all of these things mean? So without the support of women's organizations and children's organizations, we would not be here. That especially because they are using women's rights as the biggest tool to hit us with. So when all the major women's organizations are standing with us, then it's quite hard to argue against that. So, so I feel that education was one of the biggest tools that we had. Of course, supported with protests and everything that got people interested, that got people un to understand that there's something that they need to know, they need to listen, but, but all in all, it was the organizations that came to our aid. Thank you, Pina. I think that is an incredibly important thing to mention and certainly I'm sure something that was very critical towards that and on the other side I'm going to come back to like the public agenda I think that's also while at the same time it is very unfortunate that this is like a culture war thing I think at the same time it is kind of a has become kind of a litmus test in Finland for politicians that if you support a trans act are you like a liberal politician? Are you a human rights respecting politicians or not? So even for people who maybe wouldn't have that strong of an opinion previously, it kind of became the question of like, well, the voters will see if you disagree with that and they will think like, oh, that's not a politician I want to vote for if I'm a liber liberal. So kind of setting that agenda. And I think that's also, it's not just this government, but the pressure has been there for such a long time. I don't remember, and I'm sure you feel the same, how many pride uh, like marches and protests I've been to where we have been chanting trans act now, and even like now with the government that was like, well, we're gonna pass that, and it's not coming, and it's not coming, just keeping that pressure, and also keeping that pressure uh, from within, so of course within the youth organization, it has continually been on the agenda and asking kind of like, where are we going with that? What's going on in the parliament? Is it going to be uh, happening? And kind of keeping the pressure that you cannot just leave this be is important. But when thinking about international solidarity, uh, I think it's important for us now that we have reached this point. And as we have said, there are still a lot of things that need to be corrected and reformed even now, but also that we don't uh, forget the people also outside. So even though we had this win, we still need to keep fighting, uh, both here in Finland, but also globally. And uh, I, I've, been con um, I've been in connection with BBC quite a few times. They're very interested in how Finland is doing with all this. But just to emphasize how dire the situation is, every time a new journalist contacts me, I'm worried that they are going to twist my words. So I'm always where I'm kind of first kind of stepping very gently into it like what what are you trying to write about? What I how what's your point of view before I start uh, the conversation? So uh, we are also seeing that that it's kind of leaking to us whatever is happening in UK is leaking to us cuz they are also in Finland, uh, the conservatives are saying, "Look at what's happening on the islands. Uh, uh, look at like they even um, the conservatives said that in Scottish prisons that men are switching to women's prisons like like in the hundreds. That it's a it's the wave that men are uh, taking over the women's sections. And then I started to Google this. I was like, um, if if this is happening, I I guess that would have made the news at some point. So I started Googling it, and I found the only thing basically I found about this is that in Scottish prison, prisons, they had actually conducted a study. They had asked the cisgendered women uh, who had shared their sections with trans women that how did you feel your safety uh, impacted by this? And the, <laughs> they kept saying that, well, some of them were a little bit weirded out by that, but said that they didn't feel threatened with their, uh, like their security wasn't threatened. And a lot of people said that, you know, this was actually quite nice 
they were friends of mine and so on and they kept saying that male guards are more of a threat to them than transgender women uh, in the prisons so so whatever is happening abroad can be twisted because we're not following our, our mainstream media is not following up on what's actually happening in other countries so they can take whatever rumors they have and they can spread them in other countries as a fact and I feel like that's happening also the other way around that uh, our yeah, the rights of the uh, trans youth was um, a little bit strictened uh, like they uh, they made it more strict a couple of years ago that they um, Palco, the committee for the healthcare stuff. Anyway, I don't know how to say it in English, but that doesn't matter. So uh, they decided that the f uh, the the kind of fir first choice of treatment for trans youth should be psychiatrical help instead of, for example, hormonal treatment. And the UK uh, kind of took it and ran with it. And it didn't actually have a very big impact in Finland because we had had this problem the whole time. The youth were not getting their treatments. This was a dire situation from the beginning. But this couple of sentences in one paper, they took it. And that's what, when BBC contacted me a lot that what's happening in Finland, uh, that in, in the, the Finnish healthcare system decided that trans youth should be mainly treated with psychiatric help instead of hormonal treatment. And they try, kind of tried to, some of the journalists maybe kind of tried to make it sound like Finland has deemed trans youth to be t just confused and need to be corrected into the gender that they were assigned with, which is not, a, not at all what was happening. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so especially the so-called anti-gender movement is, been on the news lately. Uh, what is it, and what do we need to know about them and their background? Which movement is that, sorry? Uh, Anti-gender movement. Okay. So, um, anti-gender movement is uh, sort of an umbrella term for a lot of smaller movements that are connected. So, one of them is the anti-trans uh, movement, but it does have under that umbrella also the women's rights, the, uh, the people who are against women's rights, uh, the people who are against all in all rainbow rights uh, and uh, like reproduct reproductive uh, rights like you mentioned earlier. But this um, uh, a Swedish, uh, Swedish um, like study was made by Ulrika Westerlund uh, that they said that at the moment, trans rights are kind of the lowest hanging fruit for the anti-gender movement. That they would not be able to go to the streets and say, women should be in the kitchen. No one's gonna, well, no one's, but most people won't agree with them. But if they say, trans women are going to attack your children, that sounds much more convincing. So this is a tool. This is, it's not about trans people and trans rights. Trans people's rights are a tool that they are using to fight against human rights. And we can see this with um, uh, Istanbul Treaty, which is a treaty about kind of the safety of women in many ways. But the fact that it does mention gender, the word gender in it, so that now has caused some countries to kind of back out of it because of the word gender. So they're throwing away all these other sections of it which are protecting the rights of women and they're throwing them kind of away and claiming this treaty was always about trans rights. So they are just using us to fight against basically all human rights, but especially women's rights. So and the gender movement all in all is a very, um, global movement, and it's not even just an ideology, it's actually a strict funded movement. The, the, the funds are mainly coming from the fundamentalist conservatives of, uh, of United States, and they are very heavily influencing and financing 
uh, these movements in Europe also. So this is not just kind of a conservative thinking people. These are actually strategically planning groups of uh, people who, are, who have a goal that they're going for. Thank you, Pina. Yeah, and I think that's very important to mention also before we talked about that there is a marginal section of people who call themselves feminists that are anti-trans and it's, I think those people are also very much used and I don't want to say, oh, they're victims because they're also <laughs> being horrible towards trans people but also being used by the far right uh, to also go further with this agenda not just against trans people but against women's rights against human rights and I think that's important to recognize that it's not there are these like oh there's the anti-trans feminists and then there's the conservatives but it's actually all working in tandem whether or not everyone even themselves realizes or not and I think something that's very worrisome about like uh, the anti-trans feminists are that it <laughs> from what I see at least online and so on it can be very cultish so through that also people become stronger, kind of like, hmm, well, I'm against trans people, but maybe abortion also shouldn't be available always, or maybe I want to rethink like gay rights and how I feel about them, because it becomes a very insulated group in that sense, and I think it's so important because of that to notice how the far right is using this. I think um, both of you have made really important points about how the kind of the, the far right and conservatives are organizing across borders and globally on on this. And I think the left and progressives don't do that as effectively and we we need to be able to. Um, I, I also completely agree with the, the points about um, this being used to attack women's rights. And I mean, we see it in a microcosm in parliament where we're having these debates about legislation. And um, I mean, even if it's not about legislation that impacts trans people, there will always be invariably men, sometimes women, but often it's men on the other side of the chamber, so conservative MPs. And they're some of the creepiest men I've ever met in my life standing up to talk about how much they care about women's rights. And yeah, of course, of course they don't. This is this is just a, a pawn in a in a wider game for them. And uh, some of the uh, like some of the tools that the anti gender movement is using is I would like to say it's a divide and conquer that they are actively trying to turn human rights uh, organizations against each other, feminists against each other, uh, and. How they are doing this, it, one of the ways is that they keep popping up with new organizations, like like Mushrooms in, <laughs> in the Rain. So uh, they, they have names like International Alliance of uh, Rainbow Community or something. They, they make it seem so legitimate. But then when you go check their website or their... Instagram or Twitter or Facebook, they have like five followers. They were created two days ago and they claim that they have been working with these issues and they have a huge following and they have a lot of members and they are concerned about these things. And uh, so it, it's really confusing for people who are not working directly with these issues. It's easy for me to recognize these these keywords that they are using, because I've been working with this for years. But as a politician whose main focus has been somewhere else, and they're trying to kind of, on the side, get a hang of this, um, this matter, it's almost impossible for them to recognize which organizations are legitimate and which are focus. Yeah, I will. <laughs> seen organizations say that they are almost like a Tolkun human rights organization. It's like, what? But Pinya and then Nadia. Yeah, I would actually like to just slightly disagree with what you said, even though it's uh, the point you brought up is very important, because I think politicians actually know this, at least some of them, because the parliament also has hearings uh, before they pass an act and so on. And I think some of the politicians know that the organization they are asking to hear uh, in there is not legitimate. 
but they want legitimacy uh, for their conservative and for their anti-trans views through that. So these are again working together with this like, oh, there's an organization that's really not an organization. And then there's a politician validating that through, even though they also know this to be true. That's absolutely true that the ones who have an agenda to fight against the uh, improvement of rights, they don't care. They know that these organizations are not real, but the ones who have not yet come up with a, like, a full opinion or a stance on the matter, they get confused more with this. Yeah, not yeah, I think that's right. I think there's definitely a large element of sort of like politicians laundering their bigotry through these what are essentially front organizations. Um, and then that like wider culture of moral panic and these different groups being set up makes people who would instinctively be in the right place on on social issues just not really know what to think and not want to get involved and that's where political education is so important um but one of the things that i didn't really speak about was how in the uk how starkly reminiscent this is of um what was said around section 28 that exactly the same tropes were used about um, gay men and women in the 1980s, like they can't be trusted in the army, they can't be trusted around children um, as they're being used against trans people now. Um, and the other very key sort of leg legislative issue that's live in the UK is around conversion therapy. So conversion therapy is still legal in the UK. Um, there was a, a pledge from Boris Johnson pledged in, and he was three prime ministers ago, to outlaw conversion therapy in 2018. But he said that there would be essentially loopholes for consenting adults, which obviously is an oxymoron because conversion therapy is abuse and you can't consent to your own abuse, but also a loophole for trans people, despite the fact that trans people are, I think it's twice more likely than their LGB counterparts to um, be forced into conversion therapy. Now, after a lot of campaigning um, by LGBTQ activists, Rishi Sunak, um, our current prime minister, is now saying that a trans-inclusive ban is on the table, but we don't have any, any time frames for that happening or any assurances that it actually will happen. So that's another thing that we're, we're pushing on. Um, but again, this is where progress that has been made in Finland and in Spain helps us to kind of to, to turn the tide because people are sure as hell trying to do the same thing from the other side. Yes, sadly, it's it's legal in Finland because because of center party in the government. But Kasper, you had um, just to kind of go back to the um, the kind of international support to each other. Uh, Finland used Norway a lot because Norway passed a very progressive uh, trans act w with a conservative uh, government. So we were kind of saying, oh, if a conservative government in Norway can think like this, then you can think like this also. And it really helped. And we kept saying that we would want a Norwegian model that, of course, adjusted to our system, but anyway, the um, the age limits and so on to be kind of like Norwegian. Because in the Nordic countries, we always look at each other a lot. So we're kind of siblings in that sense that if Sweden and Norway or Denmark do something, then we should probably be doing the same. <laughs> so we, one of us does something good, the other ones can use it. Yeah, Pina. Yeah, but unfortunately, we're still going to be behind them, even with this act, especially when it comes to underage children. But I think that's also, as that's going to be the next focus, I think, or at least one of them, for sure, then it definitely helps that we have the reference point. Like, look at everybody else in the Nordic countries. Like, do we really want to be that backwards? Yeah. Now that we see the rise of populist right in, in Europe, are we going to see a more broader backslash against feminism and equality in general? What do you think? Yeah, I think undoubtedly so. And we're, we're already seeing it. And it's not just 
an attack on LGBTQ rights. It's um, with kind of growing radicalization of, for example, young boys and men and um, influencers, so-called influencers like Andrew Tate, who spread this like incel ideology. Um, and I, I, I worry about with increasing coordination of the far right and these movements globally, that that's going to get so much worse because you know it's happening in Hungary. It's, it was happening in Brazil and just because um, a, a left-wing president has been elected, it doesn't mean that that movement has gone away in Brazil. It's happening in India, in Israel, um, in China. Um, so yeah, I think that is happening, but it just makes it all the more important that the left fights back. And I, I know that I keep saying that, but there really isn't any other alternative. And that's kind of why I believe that we really will win because the alternative to us not winning is, is too bad. Thank you, Pina. Yeah, I would come back to the point that as we see these movements uh, go forwards and go towards progress, we do get a lot stronger uh, backlash and that's towards everything. And something I'm especially very worried about is what happened in the US with abortion rights just recently. I think that is a very worrying turn. And I think that also, even though I said, and I do believe that we are winning and we are going towards progress, it's something that we just need to be keep fighting for as well, even when something passes, because it's never going to be like self-evident that things are always going to be this way. Unfortunately, we will have to keep up the fight. I would hope that one day we would not, but uh, alas, I don't think we can just think that, oh, we got this thing once, now it's solved, because as we can see, rights can be also taken away, unfortunately. Thank you. Kasper, do you want to comment? Well, kind of the same ideas that uh, we saw this, we have a kind of, I feel that we have in Finland, we have considered abortion rights such a fundamental right that this would not be touched, that this would not be taken away, that this in our society sounded ridiculous. But still, Timo saw and he brought it up and, uh, and there was for a moment a push towards that, but like I said, it was the abortion rights were not the lowest hanging fruit. They did not get the the same um, enthusiasm. <laughs> so now we, in fact, got even a better legislation with abortion rights going. So that's that's huge. So unfortunately, the trans rights um, now turned out to be the lowest hanging fruit. But as I said before, some other issue will come after us. We can see this that first it was uh, the rights of black people, then it was the rights, of all in all, uh, women's rights, uh, like then there it was the gay rights, then and a lot of other ones in between, but we remember these, this is the kind of the rhythm that every time they lose one battlefield, they will find another one. And I feel that this is also a distraction. This is also a distraction that it's, uh, it's in intervening with uh, the real crisis of climate change and poverty and, and all these things that we should be talking about. And we are using so much energy talking about human rights, which are fundamental rights that every human being has when they're born, but some people just want to oppress them, want to prevent them from, from happening. So, so it's not like we're trying to invent something new. We're just trying to, uh, trying to implement the treaties that we already have internationally. So this is a, I feel that this conversation is a bit ridiculous. It is hurtful, but it's also ridiculous because it is, like you said, they are going to lose this. But it just takes so much energy and time, and <laughs> it's tiring. Yeah, thank you, Nadia. I just wanted to say something hopeful, really, about the 
there is a, a huge coalition of people who are all being subjected to this divide and rule tactic by the Conservative government in the UK um, and by governments and political parties and movements around the world as well, whether it be trans people, the, the wider LGBT community, women, people of colour, migrants, Muslims, Jews, disabled people. They're sex workers, is a, a, that's one that we often, that we don't speak about, but they really do sit at the intersection of a, of a lot of those, um, those identities and are often the, the most harmed by government policies, but are also invisible because they're made invisible. Um, but there, there is a huge coalition of people who are standing together and who are saying that you're, you're not going to pit us against each other. You're not going to pit us against, for example, white working class people. And I, I think it's important that we, as a movement, there, there is, of course, a, a small minority of very vocal people whose minds will never be changed on this because it's their life's mission to strip all of us of our human rights. But there is a, a wider group of people who are undecided or who have been drawn into this but can be, can be brought back. And I think it's really important that we kind of appeal to their material interests and say, you know, just like, and this is a, a British example, but it's, I'm sure, relevant to some extent in Finland as well, just like our National Health Service has been underfunded for 13 years by the Conservative government and trans people are waiting years for gender-affirming health care. And that's also because of specific underinvestment in, in trans health care. But that's something that all of us are suffering from. Just like everybody is finding it difficult to find a secure job, to be paid a proper wage that is keeping up with inflation. Like these, these are shared struggles and the solutions are shared as well. Thank you, Pinya and then Gaspar. Yeah, unfortunately, when it comes to healthcare and trans healthcare, we also face a multitude of issues and also, unfortunately, a lot of underfunding just in general. Uh, but I would like to add, and I think your point was uh, very good. I also think that when it comes to these kinds of issues, we actually kind of need to work with the I don't know if right is the right word, but also not necessarily make it a left question, even though I do think the liberation of people is fundamentally a left policy, but I think it's important in this sense to also make alliance across the board, even with more right-wing but liberal parties and so on, so we kind of get the feel that, that these things can be defended uh, better, I think, as well. So even though there are fundamental differences as well, uh, why people maybe support these issues. Uh, I think in these times when they are under attack, we also need to find, um, I don't really want to say allies, but I guess in that sense, uh, in there as well, at least I can see uh, when it comes to the Finnish politics, even with like right-wing Greens or the National Coalition or so on, the boot pressure to make it a liberal litmus test of these questions. Like if you say you are a liberal, you have to vote for this, you have to support this. And uh, unfortunately, this is not going to be a hopeful point I'm going out on now, but I do have to say I'm worried now also with us having war in Europe the uh, energy crisis and so on. I, I think these are things that might take a step to the back burner, that people are like, well, this is not relevant right now because we have this and these issues, which I think we kind of need to be prepared to fight even harder, even though, even though right now it's already, as you said, it's so tiresome and you just have to keep doing it. But I think that's something that has to be taken into account when looking towards upcoming years, that that might be also an argument that we face, that it's not necessarily people actively against these things, but more of an argument like, well, we don't have time for that right now. And I think we need to be prepared to defend human rights against that as well. Yeah, to say we can walk and chew gum, we can care about more than one thing at once. Yeah.
Yeah, I heard one one conservative politician say, said that why we are talking so much about the toilets, and the the, the answer was like like you are the one starting the discussion. Yeah, I, was say, I kind of agree. Why are we talking about toilets? Yeah, <laughs> but Kasper. Uh, actually, Ulrika Westerlund, who I mentioned earlier in this study, they uh, they calculated all the all the legislation uh, proposals for, uh, in Sweden from the very lowest uh, county level to the highest, and anything that had anything to do with rainbow, so anything to like any mention, majority was by the right wing politicians. So the green left was not even talking about it as much as the conservative far right uh, politicians were. So exactly why are we talking about this? We, we also want to move on to other questions. But I was going to say that uh, kind of um, adding to what you said earlier that I feel that people as a as a group, humans want to be good to each other. We do. We want to be good to people we know. We want our friends to have the same rights as we do. It's just that if we are um, we are taking a group of people and making them alien to us, uh, putting us against each other, and we can see it, that they can't. Uh, the right wing movement, the under under gender movement cannot put us, uh, like get us to fight each other if w without lies. That, that This is why they're using the lies, because if you just look at the facts, people would not be against trans rights. People would not be against human rights all in all. But with these fear-mongering tactics, they can for a while get people on their side. But the more people get to know trans people, the more we are able to be out uh, out and loud <laughs> in the society, and the more we are seen in movies, in TV shows, that the more we become a, kind of a normal part of society, the harder it is to create this hatred and fear towards us. So I feel like you, you mentioned earlier that it is the job of cis allies, because trans people are not the ones in power of choosing what kind of characters are going to be in movies. We're not in the power of choosing um, who's going to be who's who's allowed to be a news anchor, for example. So we need the cis allies to take a stance and hire to visible uh, uh, visible jobs and visible places in society. We need trans people so that we can't be ignored anymore. I think that's a, a really, really important point about too often these conversations are had by cis people about trans people, but they need to be centering the, the experiences and the expertise of trans people themselves. And that's not for lack of trying on the part of the trans community, but the, the obstacle to that is, um, is cis people in a cisgendered society so it's important that we use the power that we have with within our spaces to platform trans people to amplify their voices to amplify their demands and to stand with them and speak with them rather than speaking for them yeah thank you so now we have a time for questions from the audience i would like to ask you if you, if you have any questions Seems we have silent. turned your brains to porridge with <laughs> all this. Yeah, we talk. still. Yeah. Okay. Uh, please, could you come here to talk to the microphone so we can oh, get we, it? Maybe we can send one of these cordless ones. Ah, yeah. Good point. Thank you very much. Um, uh, my colleague Nadia was talking about how uh, a lot of right wing politicians are. Being quite successful in, in you know reaching their hands um, 
across across borders and working together in all of those different ways. And I wanted to ask how you think we could better work together as left movements in um, in different countries? Because she's absolutely right. They're, they're extremely uh, successful at it. And, and we can see them right across many, many different areas of, of, of discrimination, be it migrants' rights, uh, trans rights. So just generally, they're being really, really awful. But they're doing very well at it. And we need to do better. Thank you. That was a really good question. So... Well, I don't have an answer prepared. I was actually going to start with the difficulties, <laughs> unfortunately, because I think there is one big difference, and it's that, unfortunately, the right wing has a lot of money, and that <laughs> does play a large part in that. So I think, in general, how we see when it comes to like right versus left is like, OK, they have the money, but we have the people. So I think kind of thinking about how we can get people activated uh, regarding that and kind of just keep it going. And I think to a degree we can see that, like, uh, you know, the Helsinki Pride March has seen, like, I think a few years ago before COVID, it was, like, the largest uh, demonstration in, like, history of Finland or something one year. So we do genuinely do have that. But I guess something important would be to coordinate I, I guess, again, with that, like, how, how do we get that through and how w do we get that coordination uh, within countries, especially, and where do we get the resources? Because, again, it's more about human resources uh, while the other people have the money. And I think this is something like this is a start, of course, but not everybody has the possibility to, like, travel around Europe and talk like this. But I think kind of having the base, and I hope going forwards this week and also maybe see if there's anything else in the future we could do to support your struggle in the UK. So, yeah, Kasper. So, there are actually uh, platforms to, uh, to uh, get more connected uh, across the borders, especially the Nordic countries are now seeing much more uh, funding for um, basically anything you can do as a rainbow uh, organization but with another country's rainbow organization, then you will get the money. So if any one of you are in some rainbow organization, if you can connect with another one in one of the Nordic countries, then you will get funding for that. Uh, so this is a kind of a new new situation. Uh, and. Also, like there is money to be used, but also it's hard to know where to look for it, where to uh, how to apply for it. Uh, and uh, a, few, a couple of years, uh, 2019, Finland was the chair country for like a half a year, year uh, in the EU Parliament, so that um, our equality minister uh, called together a European. Uh, rainbow seminar that we had activists and organizations from all over EU gathering in Brussels uh, talking about these uh, the Euro I don't know how to say it in English barometry well yeah a study <laughs> you know a study across EU about all sorts of discrimination, but we of course focused on the uh, rainbow issues uh, so that we were sharing that information. We were making sure that all these, even the smallest uh, organizations get this information that is ha has been produced. So anytime there is someone in power who has that, the resources to uh, uh, kind of get us to connect then we are doing it, but as said, as you said, human resources. Uh, one of the major problems is knowing where to look for it, knowing who to contact, and so on. So we do need to. Um, again, if there is someone listening that is in a small organizations, connect with the bigger ones in Finland. The bigger ones also have a lot of information. They're very happy to share it. So, like I said, with the kind of. The, uh, the 
I didn't really sleep last night. So, <laughs> so working together with other organizations that, not, that are not in your exact field is very beneficial in many ways. And the trans organizations in Finland, for example, are tiny, but we got so much energy from the bigger organizations such as uh, Amnesty, all these things. So, so getting connected inside the country uh, with the organizations and activists, then you have more resources to get connected across the borders. But we definitely need to do that, we, definitely because we need to learn from each other. Thank you. Do you have any comment? Yeah, I think those are really good points. I think for the UK specifically, we're obviously a lot more isolated now after Brexit than we were before and there are fewer opportunities for us to kind of do that e even even the more kind of formal standard cross party working that would have happened i imagine as a matter of course um while we were in the eu um so i think maybe some practical stuff that we could do is connect with trade unions in other countries at, at the very least like our nearest european neighbors um, which should be straightforward enough to do, and also to kind of find out what we can still do within the EU and with like projects that still exist. Yeah, thank you. We have time for one question also. Uh, could, could we get the mic? <laughs> You're eager to get rid of the mic. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I've, I have a question especially for Nadia, um, and it is how likely, likely do you think that the next British government, if it were to be a Labour government, would be to pass a gender recognition bill after what we've seen in Scotland where SNP have lost uh, a lot of support and the uh, uh, cause for Scottish independence has lost, lost a lot of support after their uh, gender recognition bill failed? Overwhelmed with microphones. Um, first thing that I'd say is that I I don't think it's the case that the and I'm I'm no fan of the SNP. I'm a Labour Party politician, but I don't think it's the case that Nicola Sturgeon lost any support because of her support for trans rights. Um, that's something that's already being said by um, right wing tabloids in the UK. And actually, I think the opposite is true. I think one of the things that Nicola Sturgeon will be remembered for is her steadfast support of the trans community. Um, I think it's important that we make very clear that this isn't a, a vote loser. This is about, it's about humanity. It's also about the, the issues of class that we should be talking about and fighting about all the time. Like I, I said before about healthcare, about housing, about uh, rights at work, you know, just your, your standard bread and butter Labour issues. Um, how likely do I think it is that a Labour government will pass um, reform to the Gender Recognition Act? Well, I'm, I'm proud of a lot of the history that the Labour Party has in, um, in fighting for, for equal rights. It was the Labour Party in government that passed the Equality Act, um, that abolished section 28 and equalize the age of consent but i'm not blind to the fact that these things don't just happen in a vacuum it's not just going to happen just because we win a labor government and there we go we win everything that we'd we'd ever dreamed of it's going to be a fight i think because there are, are so many conservative forces pushing in the opposite direction and i think particularly when we have a first past the post system our political parties are especially vulnerable to that because it means that we have an electoral system that is kind of um, disproportionately skewed towards what we'd call marginal seats. So, for example, I represent Nottingham East, which has a 17,500-odd majority. That, that could be considered quite a safe Labour seat. It's one of the safest in the country. 
but then there are other seats that have like a few hundred majority and it's those seats that political parties are looking at but wh what do people in these seats care about well we'll tailor our policies towards that and it's not necessarily representative of the whole of the country so i think there's there's that particular issue in the uk as well but we're going to fight and we're going to make sure that labor in government passes um reform to this act it was a labor government that introduced the gender recognition act in the first place and we we will make sure that once um at the end of uh, a labor government's first term that things are going to be vastly improved for our whole community yeah thank you i will now we have a time for closing remarks i will ask you to be brief and i would ask uh especially about alliance building. How can we make an alliance that holds these human rights up and make, makes, like a, makes them go forward in Finland? Well, yeah, the, of course, this has been in the talks and I definitely agree with Nadia in the sense that we need to have all these, like, uh, that these interests are not opposite. So it's whether it be rainbow rights or trade union rights, women's rights, these are all for our liberation, for the rights of people of color and so on. So putting these struggles together and like making sure that we're fighting for everybody's freedom there, but also seeing that kind of solidarity and support throughout um, that. So kind of getting like, oh, well, we support the trade unions, for example, in this and kind of <laughs> would hope that that would also be mutual solidarity. So I would see that's in the larger platform of the left. Um, but then I also coming back to the point of like, to a degree, especially when it comes to human rights, there also needs to be alliance bu building towards more the center and towards more like the liberal right. Uh, and I think in that sense, kind of just like think setting the agenda, I think is important. Um, so we kind of um, see that, okay, trans rights are now the um, question on the table. For example, we saw the youth of the center party uh, actually being supportive of the act. And I don't think that would have happened if a lot of other political youth organizations already weren't like, well, we are for this, and we are for human rights, and it would have been a difficult situation for them at that point, especially labor, uh, when they label themselves, I would say, more liberal than their party, then it kind of becomes that they have to have it on the agenda because everyone else does as well. And I think that's also an important part, putting that pressure. Not sure if that's necessarily alliance building in the same way I would say it would be like in the wider left movement, but I think it's important as well. Thank you. Nadia, you... You made it sound that the UK is a bleak, rainy place. But what it can we? Place, <laughs> yeah. But what can we learn from from UK? Not the food culture, but something else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. I mean, our, our best food in the UK is not from the UK. Um, what can we learn from the UK? I. <laughs> um, I think we can learn that like, while things do seem really bleak, this huge conservative force that is backed by big money uh, across the world, but particularly in the States, still hasn't actually succeeded in its aim of stamping out our movement. And yes, we're, we're really up against it. But what I'd say to people is, don't stop what you're already doing, because I think everyone here is already making these arguments and taking a stand in their workplaces and their communities and their places of education. And it might feel really fruitless, but actually the, the outcome of that is like what you've seen the Finnish government do and what I, I hope the UK government will do very soon. Uh, thank you. And Kasper, how do you see the role of NGOs in this struggle? how to cooperate with the political parties and the NGOs, uh, do they need to cooperate? Uh, well, Finland is kind of a very great country for NGOs because we are quite well funded and it's quite easy to come up with an organization. Uh, but 
a lot of the work that should be done by government is being done by NGOs. And uh, and basically all the good ideas come from NGOs. <laughs> so, so, so all this, um, like we talked about earlier, that uh, none of the none of that progress was done originally by politicians. It was uh, activists putting together coalitions, creating NGOs, and then going forward with that message. So I think all progress is really in the hands of NGOs. Um, but of course, NGOs are not in the power. We cannot change the legislation, so we need the people inside the parliament to help us. So it is all, all it's like a puzzle. Everyone's needed. The activists who show their faces, uh, the, the scientists who do studies, uh, the, the NGOs, the, and the, then the last piece is the politicians. So, and, and especially the coalition, 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 that we work together across the party lines, ac across the borders. That's it. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for all to come, coming here to, to our discussion. And, and let's say thanks for our panelists. So thank you.